our shadowing session today we'll be hosting dr matthew kohler um he's a leader in the field of interventional pain medicine um double board certifies anesthesiologist and interventional pain specialist um this session is being recorded but we would recommend you to turn on your camera in order to um, increase interactivity between you and the speaker. And um, there will be a Q and A at the end, and you can unmute at that time. But if you would like to send in your question during the session, please type it in the chat, and Dr. Kohler will get to it um, sometime. Um, yeah. Thank you all for being here. We hope you enjoy. Um, Dr. Kohler, you can get started. Sure. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Dr. Kohler. Uh, so I'm an interventional pain medicine uh, specialist, uh, you know, kind of by, you know, uh, ACGME training. I uh, also do a lot of regenerative medicine, so PRP and stem cells, which um, something that's gaining a lot more traction and a lot more um, you know, hospitals are starting to incorporate, you know, academic centers are starting to incorporate that as, you know, part of their, uh, you know, treatments uh, that are available for patients. But, you know, it's still one of those things that isn't a uh, true kind of like fellowship or specialty within the medical realm yet. You know, it's kind of more something that's utilized in different subspecialties currently. Uh, specifically, I kind of focus more on its uses in, um, uh, regenerative medicine or uh, orthopedic conditions, uh, so you know tendinopathies and things like that. Uh, but let me share my screen here real quick and uh, and kind of get this PowerPoint loaded for you. Let's see if the easy way to do this will be. Can everyone see the uh, PowerPoint slides there? Okay. Are you getting the, uh, I guess the full version of that? Or are you getting the presenter mode version? I think the presenter version, I think. You're, you say the pre presenter version? Okay. Let me see how to make this uh, work. The problem is I have uh, the dual monitors that kind of messes with this. Uh, probably still getting the presenter version there too, right? It's okay to do it on the presenter. I think it's okay because we can still see the slides. So. Okay. Yeah, I had figured this out at one point. There we go. How about that? Better? No? Okay. <laughs> well, whatever. So, uh, apologize you know, if you're kind of seeing multiple slides here, but, um, you know, hopefully you can kind of see everything, get the gist of that there. Um, so yeah, so as mentioned, you know, kind of focusing, you know, a little bit on regenerative medicine with this talk. Um, you know, a lot of what I do is interventional pain medicine as well. Uh, so I work at a private practice in Manhattan, New York, uh, called Ospina Medical. Um, and it's, uh, you know, business we actually just founded back in 2020. So, you know, pretty new practice still, but, you know, worked in private practice with another uh group for about three years, three and a half years out of fellowship before uh, starting this with my business partner, Dr. Munyam, who's pictured here as well. Um, and uh, our focus here is, you know, really on evidence-based individualized treatment plans that aim to address root cause of pain and functional impairment for patients. So, you know, you know, with that, uh, you know, it's our, um, you know, we kind of focus on the regenerative medicine components and the interventional pain medicine components. So um, both of us, you know, kind of trained classically in pain medicine. Um, you know, my background, you know, I did human biological anthropology and pre-medicine when I was in college at Emory. Uh, went to University of Virginia for medical school for four years and then did an anesthesiology residency at Columbia uh, here in New York for four years uh, before doing my pain medicine fellowship. Um, so this is just kind of a summary and you know, something I'm sure that you all are kind of aware of the, uh, the path it takes to, to kind of become a doctor. But, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty long road, but, you know, something that's very rewarding kind of once you get to the other side of things. Um, you know, so I did, uh, you know, the four years undergrad. I did an actual like a gap year where I did some research uh, with a research scholarship. Uh, then the medical school residency fellowship. Um, and then beyond that was kind of just working in private practice where, you know, even once you're out of your residency and fellowship training, um, 
you know, those first few years, you're learning a ton. Uh, you're kind of learning how to practice independently and how to kind of, um, you know, kind of practice uh, outside of, you know, the kind of safe walls of academia, um, you know, if you choose to kind of go that route. But, um, you know, for regenerative medicine, there's a lot of additional education as well, because this wasn't really something that was kind of classically taught to us. So, you know, I spent a lot of time going to conferences and still do, uh, doing weekend courses, doing a lot of shadowing of um, specialists in this field, uh, a lot of self-educating, you know, that, that, you know, time in front of the textbook uh, doesn't really end, uh, you know, after medical school, but, um, you know, all of this is, uh, you know, information, at least with the general medicine, I think will become more readily available to you as you guys kind of progress through your training and kind of get into uh, your specialties. Um, so, you know, why did I choose regenerative medicine? Um, you know, so, you know, chronic pain is incredibly prevalent. You know, a lot of people have pain issues, whether it's back pain or, you know, joint pain or, you know, post-surgical, you know, pain that, you know, is, you know, difficult to manage. So, um, you know, there's a, a large patient population that's in need of people that can treat pain issues. Uh, you know, there's also, um, you know, the ongoing opioid epidemic uh, and the mismanagement of pain in general. So, um, you know, classically, you know, when you look at like the interventional pain medicine field, you know, a lot of what we're doing is, you know, injection based, you know, so, um, for example, uh, as an anesthesia and pain trained uh, specialist, you know, I did a lot of like epidurals for you know, herniated discs in the back or nerve blocks, particular, you know, joint issues, um, even joint injections with steroids. And, you know, these actually are all helpful. You know, they provide a lot of relief for, you know, certain acute pain uh, concerns. But, you know, we, you know, at least I found that, you know, patients would kind of get, you know, a couple months of relief, three months of relief, and then the pain would kind of come back. Um, so you're kind of putting a bandaid in a lot of the issues without really giving, um, you know, a true kind of cure for them or a long-term, you know, kind of treatment for them. Um, you know, and I think with my, you know, my values, I kind of, um, you know, kind of highly regard kind of naturally getting people better as much as they possibly can, um, you know, without the need for, you know, one surgery, two harmful medications like opioids, and then three, you know, potentially harmful medications like steroids, which have actually been shown in recent research to potentially accelerate degeneration of a joint or, uh, you know, particular cartilage tissue. So, um, you know, it's, it's things that are kind of best to avoid. And that's where kind of regenerative medicine kind of came in for me. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, those standard treatment options, you know, it's those pain medicine treatments, which, you know, kind of have their, you know, all, all have their own risks, uh, and benefits. And then there's orthopedic surgery or spine surgery with neurosurgeons, um, you know, to kind of give a more long-term treatment option for patients. You know, the downside of, you know, the surgeries, uh, is that a lot of times, you know, they're not a permanent fix for things there's a higher risk of complications with those. So, um, you know, anytime you're getting, you know, especially a spine surgery or something like that, you're often giving, you know, you know, general anesthesia for many hours it requires a hospital stay. So often there's, you know, um, risk for cardiac, uh, and lung issues, you know, especially if they're not healthy already, you know, always a risk of infection at the surgical site or just in general and being in the hospital, things like that. So, um, it's always better to try to encourage avoiding that where you can. Um, and regenerative medicine is kind of helping to kind of fill that gap a little bit. Um, you know, just, you know, with regenerative medicine, you know, just to kind of, um, you know, touch on you know, why this is such a great thing. You know, one of them is that, uh, you know, it's using your body's own natural healing mechanisms to help treat uh, degeneration or injuries. So, um, you know, we kind of know that the body has this remarkable ability to heal itself. You know, you can see that whenever you have an injury, uh, someone breaks a bone, something along those lines, you know, a lot of times they're able to heal without much, you know, intervention from, um, you know, you know, surgery or any other kind of, um, implants or anything like that. So, you know, the body's ability to heal is pretty incredible. 
and has better long-term results actually than using steroids for these kinds of treatments. Uh, so when done by, you know, appropriately trained physicians, this is something that you can really harness to really get a I'm lot Dr. of- Dr. Cola, changes. quick question. Yep. Sure. Um, everyone is thinking not able to see the slide. It's only staying on the first two slides. We're only able to see the first two slides. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. After yeah. the second slide, we can't see anymore. See. Okay, now we can see all the slides. So I think I'm so okay. sorry about that, guys. Um... What do you have up on the screen right now? Okay, I can see all the slides, so it's okay. We can see the six, and then now we see seven. Oh, got it, got it. Yeah, I don't know how to switch this. Let, give me one second to play around this guy. That's why I'm gonna give you guys the best experience. I do apologize for the uh, kind of mix oh, up here. Right? If I do it that way, is that a little better? I'm switching the next slide, and we'll see if it works. Okay, this works perfect. Is it working? Okay. Yeah, don't, don't, um, yeah, don't be bashful. Interrupt me if that happens again. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, so just so you can kind of quickly see, you didn't miss much. Basically, just the words I was saying. So, uh, so, um, you know, with regenerative medicine, I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, some of like the controversy that does exist with this. Um, you know, so, you know, marketing in general has kind of brought a lot of awareness to regenerative medicine as a treatment option for patients. Uh, the problem with uh, anything like this is that, you know, there's sometimes illegitimate practitioners that will kind of jump on the hype train to try to offer this for patients uh, and make, make a few, few dollars in the process. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of, um, you know, we call it like the, the wild west of regenerative medicine because there are a lot of kind of practitioners across the country who, um, because the FDA hasn't really caught up in a lot of ways with the kind of treatments that are being offered, are offering things that uh, aren't necessarily, you know, safe or effective for patients. Um, so, um, you know, there's practitioners that are kind of making false claims of stem cells in particular, and I'm sure, um, you know, you guys may have heard about some of the confusion with these things, but you know, saying that they can use it to like, treat, you know, uh, spinal cord injuries or autism, uh, you know, other neurodegenerative conditions, regrowing tissue, treating tumors and cancer. Um, and then some other claims that have kind of been made uh, that aren't true that, you know, umbilical or amniotic tissue products contain actual live uh, stem cells. Um, so, um, you know, what that means is, you know, when you have an umbilical or amniotic tissue product, they're basically taking like uh, what's called like the Wharton's jelly, which is a um, fluid that kind of uh, is in the umbilical cord of a, you know, placenta after delivery. And with that, they can take, you know, a blood product that has, you know, at that time, some stem cells and it has hyaluronic acid and some other growth factors in it. But in order to make that into a product that you can then turn and inject into somebody else, you have to irradiate that tissue. And that basically kills any of the live stem cells in it. So the issue with this is that, you know, you might have a practitioner that's claiming that, you know, they can, you know, help repair or regrow turtilage in the knee with live stem cells from amniotic tissue. But the reality is that's, that's not the case. Uh, and that has been studied and kind of shown. So, you know, it's, it's, you know, confusing place for patients right now, you know, kind of knowing what's legitimate, you know, what, what isn't, um, you know, also it's not covered by insurance. So this is all kind of considered experimental right now. There are some cases where it'll be covered in, in orthopedic surgeries. They can bill for it if they're using it as like, you know, uh, to help repair bone craft or, you know, any other kind of tissue that they're repairing. So I think some insurances rarely will kind of cover it, but uh, not totally getting there yet. Uh, so what would you say, you know, kind of do here? Um, so, you know, again, kind of talking a little bit about, you know, what is regenerative medicine? You know, the actual term is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, so it comes from using the body's own growth factors to heal tissues, but not necessarily regrowing tissue, uh, tissues. So, you know, you hear about, you know, the, uh, a lot of the lab studies that are going on and some actually really cool stuff that's uh, going on in some of the labs, you know, across the country and I guess across the world as well, that, um, you know, they're actually able to use like embryonic stem cells or, you know, pluripotent stem cells to 
um, actually regenerate tissues or grow tissues in the laboratory setting. We are obviously, you know, not there yet with, you know, um, doing this in uh, humans, um, but, uh, you know, kind of is promising that, you know, we're learning the capabilities and, um, you know, ways that we can uh, put this into use in the medical community. Uh, so a lot of this stuff is kind of a long ways off, but, you know, the things that are, you know, kind of, you know, we're able to do now, you know, do relate to your body's own PRP and your own stem cells. Um, so, you know, with regenerative medicine, um, you know, you're really just helping your body do what it normally does to heal. Uh, for example, if you cut your arm, local platelets and stem cells react and start the healing process. Um, you know, and this is what you kind of want. You want that initial inflammation because that helps signal your body to heal that tissue. And this is a good thing. You know, but if you get caught in a chronic inflammation cycle, you know, with recurrent injury or osteoarthritis or some other degenerative condition, um, then it's a little bit, uh, um, you know, kind of harder to treat. So, uh, you know, when to use orthobiologics. Um, so orthobiologics, you know, it's basically a lump term for like PRP, stem cells, something called al alpha-2 macroglobulin. Um, and these are things that can kind of be, you know, re-injected to help heal, uh, injured tissue. So, you know, a lot of times surgery is an indicated thing, you know, so for example, if you had a totally torn, you know, rotator cuff, um, you know, that's something that would require surgery. You know, you're not going to be able to repair a complete tear of a tendon with just PRP. Um, you know, but there are a lot of patients that are in that gray area where it's, they have, you know, a partial tear that, you know, they're having a tough time treating or having it heal on its own. Um, and they don't quite qualify for surgery or surgery might not really give them the best outcomes or results. So, you know, this is kind of a perfect kind of place for the use of regenerative medicine, because you can actually kind of help accelerate that healing process for them, you know, and usually with, you know, implementing, uh, physical therapy and other kinds of things to help the healing process. Um, and help them avoid surgery and help them kind of get back to, you know, a uh, high level of function sooner. Uh, so we always want to use surgery as a last resort, you know, for orthopedic conditions uh, when possible. Um, so tissue regeneration orthobiologics refers to treatments that facilitate the healing of degenerated tissue using biologic products. Orthobiologics can be used to reverse degenerative processes, even if the new tissue cannot be stimulated to fully regenerate. Um, so like I said, you're not necessarily growing a new knee, but if you have some, you know, mild, moderate arthritis in that knee, you can kind of help that cartilage, uh, heal a little bit. Um, so he, this is just a list of some of the common things that we are using regenerative medicine to treat. So tendinitis, you know, tendinosis, so it's, you know, acute inflammation of a tendon and then degeneration of a tendon. It's not inflammatory. You know, and when that becomes a little bit more chronic um, or where they have more repetitive injury in the tendon, you can start getting breakdown of the collagen in the tendon, and that's a tendinopathy. Uh, ligament injuries, uh, so if someone has chronic ankle sprains, but not complete tears of the ligaments in their ankle, they're actually generally pretty good candidates for this. Um, osteoarthritis uh, is something that there's been a lot of research on. So, you know, we commonly use this for um, shoulders, uh, foot and ankle arthritis, knee arthritis is obviously a common one. Um, and then, you know, in the joints called the facet joints of the spine, uh, you can actually do these injections and get pretty good results as well. Um, we're doing it for intervertebral disc injuries. So, uh, you know, the disc herniations, things like that, you can use to treat uh, with regenerative medicine and then meniscus tears in the knee is a pretty common one as well. So basically, you know, Kind of thing in common with a lot of that is you know mostly cartilaginous structures so um you know the joints have a lot of cartilage in it um obviously and then the ligaments and tendons surrounding it as well um so some of the conditions uh commonly treated so you know we kind of focus on a lot of different areas you know of the body so um you know when we're doing these procedures you know um my training again is in uh classically an interventional pain management and you know, with that, you're really becoming a specialist in the spine. So, you know, most of these fellowships really kind of focus on, you know, cervical spine, thoracic spine, and lumbar spine care. 
so that's kind of the place where I'm most comfortable with uh, my skill set um, and uh, you know the joints. Um, you know, definitely something we learn a lot about as well, but uh, not as uh, much of a focus during our, our fellowship training. So this is something that's kind of, you know, kind of, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, kind of shadowing other physicians in this field, going to a lot of conferences, things like that, to kind of get a little bit more specialized in this. So, um, you know, again, it's a lot of like, you know, tendon tears, um, ligament laxity, osteoarthritis, those kinds of things. So pretty much any joint, and, uh, including the spine, can be treated with this. Um, so this is uh, PRP. So PRP stands for platelet-rich plasma. Um, and PRP basically aims to provide a favorable environment to orchestrate the interaction of cytokines and growth factors uh, to stimulate that natural healing uh, response. Um, so the definition of PRP is any sample of autologous blood that is processed to obtain a plasma sample with platelet concentrations that are uh, more than the baseline blood values. So for example, when we're doing our PRP treatments here, you know, we have a lab platform that allows us to get up to 20X PRP. So that means 20 times the normal concentration of your uh, blood level of platelets. Um, and uh, when we're doing that, we're you know, kind of getting rid of you know, the uh, white blood cells, we're getting rid of the red blood cells, um, and really just keeping that plasma and the platelets uh, with all the growth factors. Um, and uh, you know this is shown to support healing by supplying the growth factors, you know, cy <coughs> excuse me, cytokines, chemokines, and then <coughs> excuse me, and then other bioactive compounds as well. Um, so the platelets play a role in both uh, hemostasis and wound healing by releasing growth factors to stimulate other uh, cells in the body to migrate to that area of trauma and facilitate the tissue healing. So one of the ways they kind of think that. PRP, you know, and stem cells as well, kind of heals tissue is, you know, this release, release of the um, cytokines and growth factors uh, helps to signal uh, transition from that, you know, a joint, for example, being in a chronic inflammatory and breakdown state uh, into being into more of a uh, anabolic uh, state where it is facilitating angiogenesis, meaning growing new blood vessels there, as well as help, helping to stimulate, you know, uh, tissue regrowth uh, and healthy tissue there. Um, so this is just a uh, image kind of demonstrating a platelet and a lot of the different cytokines and growth factors that it can release. So you can see here, it actually has a lot of different roles. You know, a lot of times when you kind of think of a platelet, classically, it's like, you know, clotting your blood, right? You get a cut and it kind of clots the cut. But um, you know, it actually has a lot of other roles as kind of the first responder to an area of injury. Um, so it helps with inflammation, hemostasis, uh, bacterial defense, so it can help prevent infection, wound healing, uh, resolution of, uh, you know, kind of wound healing, tissue reorganization, and then angiogenesis, as I mentioned before. So a lot of different roles that this kind of serves to, um, you know, help heal tissue. Um, <clears throat> And then stem cell treatments, you know, the other kind of more common treatment that we're using. Um, so a stem cell is an undifferentiated cell of a multicellular organism that can give rise to more cells of a particular differentiated cell type. So, um, you know, basically, you know, you have, you know, totipotent or pluripotent or multipotent uh, stem cells uh, that can basically give rise to multiple different types of tissue cells. So you know, bone cells, for example, or cartilage cells, liver cells, you know, these can kind of be differentiated down certain, certain pathways based on the body's need and cell signaling to that stem cell. Uh, so your body kind of lets that stem cell know, you know, what it needs, it can help differentiate into that uh, path. Um, so they have this unlimited self renewal capability. Um, and, you know, the conditions, like I said, kind of really influence that cell's ability to kind of turn into something um, of need for the body. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, you have your totipotent stem cells, pluripotent, which is embryonic stem cells, and then multipotent. So multipotent stem cells, <clears throat> or we kind of focus our uh, procedures here in the U.S. anyways, uh, because embryonic stem cells are not um, FDA approved uh, to be used for any kind of, uh, you know, injection or interventional um, procedure in the U.S. at this time. Um, 
So, you know, generally speaking, you know, mesenchymal stem cells are the ones that are being used in the U.S. And these are the stem cells that, uh, you know, we can commonly derive from uh, bone marrow or adipose tissue. Hematopoic stem cells we can also derive from bone marrow, but the mesenchymal ones are the ones when we're doing, uh, you know, uh, injections for pain procedures that can actually help differentiate and heal that tissue. Uh, so you can see here, they can differentiate into muscle, tendon, uh, ligament, cartilage, and bone. Um, so, um, like I said, hematopoietic uh, stem cells give rise to blood products. The mesenchymal can kind of give rise to pretty much anything else. So, um, you know, they have a, a, a pretty broad ability to differentiate into different things. <clears throat> so these are just a, a list of some of the common stem cells uh, sources. Um, so, you know, you know, we kind of talked about, you know, like embryonic and umbilical cord and, um, you know, the amniotic, uh, from the chorion of donated placentas, you know, but those are kind of more used for, you know, laboratory studies and the ones that are used for injections in the U S you know, technically don't have any live stem cells in them. So, you know, that kind of leaves us with the, um, you know, basically the hematopoietic stem cells and the autologous stem cells from bone marrow and adipose tissue. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, mesenchymal stem cells, as I mentioned, you know, commonly we're using bone marrow derived, uh, here in our practice. This is actually a picture of an, uh, x-ray. So, um, you know, the dark black is actually the needle that's going into the crest, uh, of the patient. Um, cause that's the area that's been found to have the kind of the richest density of stem cells. Uh, so we'll access the iliac crest to harvest those. Um, and a procedure using ultrasound and x-ray guidance like this. Um, the other way that a lot of clinics in the U.S. are doing it is with the adipose derived. Um, and these are, you know, <clears throat> relatively easy to harvest. They have a pretty high cell yield and actually it's been found to be higher than bone marrow. Um, but the problem with that is uh, they tend to be trapped in the, uh, in the fat cells. So um, because of that, and then because the FD doesn't allow you to kind of break down those fat cells to make the stem cells more available, um, you know, there is some uh, thought that they might not be as effective because uh, you can't really um, process that in a way where they're as accessible as when you get it from the bone marrow. Um, so when you're talking about the stem cells, uh, you know, we kind of think of it as like the general contractor. Uh, so it works through paracrine effects, you know, so it secretes chemical messages called cytokines. Um, and these mediate and regulate, you know, immunity, inflammation, hematopoiesis. Um, and they also secrete something called exosomes, which is something you guys might have heard about, um, you know, at some point. But exosomes are basically, you know, tiny packets that are excreted by stem cells and containing snippets of um, microRNAs. Um, and a stem cell can use these microRNAs protein instructions to basically task other cells to make proteins on its behalf. Uh, so it really works to signal the local environment through these mechanisms to kind of, you know, and, uh, encourage the body to do its job with healing. Um, you know, so there is, you know, com conflicting kind of thoughts here. Um, you know, so the stem cells do differentiate, you know, into certain tissues, but there's actually some new thought coming out that, you know, it's not, it might not be that differentiation of the stem cells into cartilage, for example, or bone, for example, that's necessarily uh, healing that injury or that arthritis, but maybe more that it's encouraging the environment to heal robustly versus, you know, differentiating into new tissue for that injured uh, joint or uh, tendon. Uh, so there's a lot of actual, you know, research that needs to come out on this, you know, soon, but it's definitely something that, you know, I do think, um, you know, we'll learn more and more about over the coming years. Uh, so, you know, this is actually a picture of our laboratory <clears throat> and as our, uh, lab processor, Rulita. Um, so, uh, you know, the way that we do it at our, uh, clinic is actually pretty sophisticated, you know, compared to a lot of offices. So there are some like bedside kits where you, know, you basically draw the blood, you put it into a special tube, run it in a centrifuge, and then take it from the centrifuge and uh, basically re-inject it that way. Problem with that is you don't really know 
specifically what concentration you're getting for the patient. Um, and you can't make as many different types of products. Um, by having a flexible lab port platform, uh, like the one that we've been using, you can make you know, a much higher concentration, you can make it very specific, and there's different products you can make um, you know, that you can't necessarily make with a bedside kit. Um, so these are just some of the specialized regenerative medicine products you know, that we're kind of using. So as I mentioned, the concentrated PRP, which we can get up to 20X, uh, platelet lysate. Uh, so that's basically taking PRP, freezing it, and then thawing it. And in that process, it actually lyses open the platelet. And this actually helps to release all of the growth factors from those platelets. Um, and then you kind of filter out uh, kind of like the cell body part of it. Um, and you can re-inject this uh, around like nerve structures and things like that without creating an inflammatory reaction. So this actually works more as a strong anti-inflammatory. Uh, so it's a great product for people that, you know, have like a sciatica or a disc herniation, something along those lines. You can also get platelet poor plasma, <clears throat> which has a lot of growth factors in it. Stem cells, as we mentioned, the adipose tissue, which you can re-inject, and then A2M, which is alpha-2 macroglobulin. And this helps to prevent the breakdown of cartilage by inhibiting proteinases. Um, so another, you know, very useful tool in these cases. Um, so anytime we're kind of doing a regenerative medicine procedure, and this is true for any kind of interventional spine procedure as well, you know, we're very, uh, um, you know, I guess very precise with, you know, the treatments that we're giving. So we always want to use image guidance. Uh, so whether that's using x-ray uh, or ultrasound, uh, which are the two that we most commonly use, uh, we always want to get the injectate specifically where it's needed. So you know, there are some people that actually do blind injections and just kind of do it by feel or landmarks or things like that. But um, you know, it's kind of been shown that by doing it that way, uh, you're having a lower likelihood of its success with the actual treatment. Doing it with, you know, precise image guidance, you know, you know for a fact you're kind of getting the medication where it needs to be. Uh, and that way you're kind of uh, optimizing the outcomes for your patient, which, you know, is really the most important thing is making sure that you're really giving them the best chance to heal uh, optimally. So, um, you know, using that precision guidance is a big part of that optimization. And then there's other things too. So when you're thinking about, uh, you know, orthobiologics, um, it's going to be uh, likely be more effective in a patient that's pretty healthy. So someone that has an optimized metabolic microenvironment. So, you know, what I mean by that is, you know, people that have diabetes or kind of overweight, high cholesterol, um, have a lot of just systemic inflammation, things like that, generally are not going to do as well with these procedures because you're really kind of relying on that body that may not be optimized to kind of heal itself. So um, you really want to try to get these patients, you know, corrected in terms of any vitamin and mineral deficiencies you know, really check their hormonal balance uh, and inflammation to make sure that's under control. And then um, using appropriate supplements and nutritional interventions to kind of get them optimized beforehand as well. Uh, this is some, you know, uh, famous athletes that have undergone uh, regenerative medicine procedures uh, in the past. Um, so it's definitely something that's kind of gaining some traction, uh, especially in the sports world. And um, you know, four of these kinds of orthopedic conditions where, you know, you're really trying to get people back on their feet with avoiding surgery. Um, you know, the one downside, uh, you know, I would say, if you really want to call it a downside with regenerative procedures is that there is a little bit of recovery period. So, you know, for example, if we're just doing like a nerve block or doing a steroid injection, a patient might get better, you know, within a day or two and can kind of go back and, you know, kind of live their life a little bit more comfortably. With a peer peer stem cell procedure, usually uh, we're talking, you know, you know, four to eight weeks generally for you know kind of the recovery process to kind of fully take hold. Doesn't mean they'll have discomfort for that long, but because you're creating a inflammatory response initially with these treatments, um, you know, they'll have some increased pain, you know, especially in the first two days, and then that pain will kind of taper off over a couple of weeks. Uh, and during that period, you're kind of having them rest, you're having them do PT, and then uh, slowly kind of getting them back into full activity. So it's not a quick fix per se for uh, these kinds of conditions. You almost have to think about it as, you know, kind of like a post-op kind of period. Um, 
So um, yeah, I just want to get into a couple of cases here, just so you guys can kind of see some examples of, you know, how we might use this. Um, and uh, just let me know uh, if I'm running over on time or not. But um, you know, this first case, 26-year-old uh, female uh, has, you know, had low back pain with intermittent right lower extremity uh, radiculopathy for greater than three years. Um, so for those of you that don't know what radiculopathy is, it's basically sciatica. So if you have a pinched nerve in the back, you know, let's say the L1, L2, L3, L4 level, you know, you get this kind of uh, classic pattern of pain kind of traveling down the legs. Um, so uh, this particular patient, you know, had a pinched nerve in the back, causing those symptoms down the legs for a pretty long time and tried a lot of different things. Pain was pretty severe, seven out of 10 most days. Um, you know, when I examined the patient, had a lot of tenderness on the back, uh, pain with, you know, pretty much any movement. So with extending backwards, flexing forward, <clears throat> uh, had decreased sensation in the leg where that L5 nerve root generally kind of travels, um, but had general, generally good strength and things like that. Uh, so this patient uh, got an MRI. So generally, any, anytime someone presents with, you know, that sciatica leg pain, we'll get the MRI pretty early on. And uh, it showed that she had L4-5 moderate diffuse disc bulge and what's called right foraminal narrowing. So that means that this L4-5 disc that was bulging uh, towards the side was kind of bulging out and compressing the nerve a little bit. And you can kind of see that in this image here uh, at the top right. You can see kind of a central disc bulge and it's a little bit narrow where the nerve comes out on that right side. Uh, and then also has a small disc herniation at L5-S1 uh, which you kind of see at that bottom right picture. Um, there's a little thin white line there, and that's a tear in the actual disc uh, that the patient has. So relatively young patient, you know, two kind of dark degenerated bulging discs there um, with, you know, pretty significant symptoms, you know, seven out of 10 pain and low back pain, pain down the leg, you know, kind of in, uh, limiting her uh, functionality to a pretty significant degree had to take a lot of NSAIDs and, you know, uh, medications to help treat her symptoms. So it came to us kind of looking for alternative. Uh, and this is a case that you wouldn't really send to surgery because there's not, you know, any severe nerve compression or anything like that. So, you know, she was a good uh, candidate for this treatment. So uh, she had already done multiple rounds of PT, did a lot of activity modification, um, had done multiple steroid epidural injections, uh, I was just looking for some long-term solutions for her pain complaints. Um, so this is a picture uh, on the right here of uh, the actual procedure. So in this step of the procedure, we're actually doing um, epidurals. So this is, you know, S1. So it's a sacral portion here. <clears throat> we did an injection going up this nerve and another one at the L5 on the right side there. And this is kind of what a, this top right picture is kind of a, uh, you know, what a typical setup looks for one of these cases. So it's a lot of things that we're preparing for uh, regenerative medicine procedure. You know, part of it is, you know, prolotherapy, which is basically sugar water that we're doing uh, into some of the ligaments and tendons, uh, a lot of numbing medication, contrast, um, and then the PRP products, which you can see, which are the yellow ones here. Uh, that we inject, you know, kind of different concentrations in different areas throughout the spine. And that picture on the bottom right, you can actually see, uh, you know, this is probably a fraction of all the x-rays we actually took during the case, but, you know, to get into each location, um, you know, we use the x-ray guidance to kind of help, help with that. And, you know, part of this, we did two-level intradiscal. So that means that we um, basically access the disc with a needle um, at those two levels where the injured disc was, and we injected a high concentration but low volume of platelets into that disc uh, to help that disc heal. We also did some epidurals with the platelet lysate, which I kind of explained before, is <clears throat> the anti-inflammatory. And then uh, we treated a lot of the ligaments uh, and the facet joints surrounding the spine to help provide structural support to this tissue. And this again is just the uh, intradiscal injection and you can see uh, a little faint, but on the bottom disc, there's some contrast within the disc. This is kind of looking at it from the side. And you can see that when you injected, you know, on that MRI, 
uh, there was that tear that we that I mentioned that was actually leaking fluid out of the back. So that means you had a pretty significant tear there, um, you know, that we were kind of treating, which you don't always know <clears throat> until you do this contrast injection. Um, so, you know, we kind of knew at this moment that she was gonna, you know, be a good candidate for this and that we were able to get the uh, PRP exactly where we needed it to go to help heal that tear. This is not a true before or after for that particular case because it hasn't been long enough for follow-up at this point. But this is from the uh, Regenix blog. So Regenix is the company that we, you know, use to uh, kind of provide the PRP and sub cell treatments. Um, you know, definitely something I encourage you guys to look up if you do have some time. Um, they have a really, uh, really good blog actually on, uh, you know, different uh, you know, kind of topics and things like that within regenerative medicine. So I encourage you guys to sign up for if that's something that you guys are interested in. But this is something from their blog kind of showing an example before and after. So on the left <clears throat> at that L45 disc, circled in red, there's a pretty big disc herniation there. That's pretty obvious to uh, anyone that's never even looked at an MRI. Um, you can see afterwards, and I believe this was, you know, six to 12 months after, uh, you get some uh, or significant recession of that disc. So you know, there's probably two factors at play here. One, you know, I'm sure the regenerative medicine procedure helped accelerate the healing process, you know, but with time, you know, these discs can kind of normally heal on their own a little bit too. But, you know, it's been shown that with these treatments, you can kind of make that process a little bit more efficient. And this is basically the same uh, disc, but in a different view. So this is kind of like looking from the feet up towards the head. Uh, and this is the canal where the nerves run the dark gray dots are the nerve roots and then the whiter stuff around, it's just the fluid. And you can see on the before image, you don't really have, you can barely see those nerve roots. You can barely see where the fluid is because this disc is kind of bulging out so much. So it's really kind of compressing all those nerves and causing you know pain and symptoms related to that. So you know, once that disc kind of heals up, then you can kind of get um, you free those nerves and then that resolves your pain and symptoms. Um, and this is just another case. Um, so this is a uh, 66-year-old, uh, had chronic right foot and ankle pain, um, pain with walking, prolonged standing, wearing high heels, uh, pretty severe pain with activity, eight out of 10. Um, and this patient had, a, uh, so the big toe, the first uh, toe in the foot had, uh, you know, kind of a large bone spur on it, a lot of pain with any kind of movement of that joint. Um, so it had pretty severe arthritis uh, and what's called a hallux valgus, which is when that arthritis kind of forces the big toe to kind of curve inwards a little bit. Um, let's see if this video works here. So this is uh, kind of just a video kind of scrolling through the MRI for the patient. And kind of coming up here, this is that first MTP joint. Um, I'll wait for it to kind of come through and pause it here. So you can see, you know, at the top of that joint, there's this giant bone spur there and pretty much bone on bone along the joint line. Uh, and you can't really see it in this cut, but there's actually a lot of fluid in the joint as well. Um, so I have pretty severe arthritis there. Um, and this was a patient that was actually looking at different surgery options. So <clears throat> one of them was something called a Cartiva injection or uh, implant. And, uh, you know, this is actually something I talked the patient out of because it has such a high failure rate. So it has like a 50% failure rate at this time. Um, and they're basically opening up the joint, drilling a hole in one of the bones, inserting this little cartilage structure there that you can see pictured, and then closing the joint back up around that with the idea that that's acting as a spacer to prevent the bone on bone friction. Um, but again, really high failure rate. And then the other option for this is a fusion uh, which, uh, you know, the patient didn't want because it really limits the range of, uh, range of motion there. Um, and when you have that, then you start getting stress on other joints kind of surrounding that one. Um, and you, you know, can't really wear high heels and things like that after that. Um, so we ended up doing a, uh, stem cell injection for her. So we injected that first NTP joint, <clears throat> excuse me. And we also injected the ankle as well because she had some um, joint degeneration arthritis there as well. 
Uh, we also treated a lot of the ligaments surrounding the ankle and foot to kind of provide uh, more support and stability. So by treating those ligaments, you can help them kind of tighten up and strengthen them. And that helps support the surrounding joints and then helps take some of that stress and risk of re-injury and re-aggravation away from it. So that's part of the reason why we kind of do it that way. Um, how am I doing on time here? Should we jump on the questions or we want to do one more case? Um, we can do one more case and go to the questions. Okay. And then, uh, so this case, uh, we have a 73-year-old female. Uh, so she presented with uh, right shoulder pain for a greater than three years, also severe pain, eight out of 10 most of the time. Um, you know, exam had a lot of, you know, limitations in range of motion and, um, you know, kind of just doing all the tests for the shoulder, you know, had a lot of pain and discomfort. Had a right shoulder MRI, um, showed severe glenohumeral joint arthritis, very bad bone on bone, uh, uh, glenohumeral joint changes, a lot of fluid in the joint. So an effusion is basically when you have a lot of inflammatory fluid there. And then uh, tears of the tendons and the rotator cuff that help support the uh, shoulder joint as well and help move it. Uh, so this patient had very severe degeneration, very severe tears in the tendons. Um, so, uh, you know, you can kind of see this a little bit on the MRI, but the bright white spots that you can kind of see everywhere, that's just, that's joint swelling, that's joint uh, effusion that's kind of lighting up there. Uh, you can see a lot of thinning of what's called the supraspinatus tendon here um, and degeneration there. Um, that was kind of causing a lot of her symptoms. Um, so <clears throat> this patient obviously did, you know, lots of PT over the years, tried a lot of different steroid injections, um, had done some PRP injections in the past with a little bit of benefit. Um, you know, this is a patient that the arthritis was so severe that we would actually say was overall kind of like a poor candidate. Uh, but the patient was really motivated to try stem cells as an option. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we went forward with it. Um, and treated her with intraarticular stem cells as well as PRP in the surrounding ligaments, the tendons of the rotator cuff, which uh, were torn, and then did you know really serious rehab post procedure. <clears throat> so this is a patient that really is a candidate for a shoulder joint replacement. Um, but with this procedure, we've kind of helped her, you know, maybe not avoid it forever, but have really kind of improved her symptoms to a point that she's able to. Kind of function, you know, significantly better uh, than she did prior to this treatment. You know, she reported greater than forty percent overall improvement. Which, you know, you know, when you're a pain physician, you know, you always want to see like fifty percent improvement overall if you can. But you know, in a patient that has this severe degeneration, this severe of an issue, um, you know, they'll take anything they can get. So this was, you know, and and our minds, you know, definitely a win for her because uh, it has helped her avoid surgery at this point, and she can kind of function a lot better now. Um, so yeah, just quick summary. Uh, you know, I really think, you know, regenerative medicine in general definitely a big part of the future of pain in orthopedic medicine. Um, definitely an exciting field. Uh, so I think whether you're interested in research uh and like the basic science or if you're interested in more of the technical components and the treatments you know i think there's something for everyone with it um definitely try to make some time to learn about it if you can um it's you know at least when i was in medical school which was you know years and years ago you know they weren't really treated uh training us to kind of you know know much about regenerative medicine at that time so uh, i think there'll be a lot more opportunity for you younger guys to kind of learn about this more um, and, you know, feel free to use me as a resource. Um, you, know, you know, our website has some information on it. Uh, you can find me on uh, social media as well. Dr. Kohler's, uh, my Instagram handle, Think and Kohler MD's Twitter and Facebook. But if you're interested, you can just give me a follow or shoot me a message if you have any questions. Uh, and here's some more information here as well. Um, so yeah, so let's I guess get to some of your questions here. All right. So, I, um, would you want me to read the questions or are you good reading them? Uh, yeah, if you want to read them, maybe. I don't even know. Oh, here's the chat. Just found it. Um, most of it is Dr. Corey stuck on the first slide. Yeah, sorry about that earlier, guys. 
kind of got that sorted out. But um, so Jennifer was asking, was the mechanism of action for orthobiologics? Um, so, you know, we kind of discussed a little bit of this, but um, it really kind of just depends on which one you're using. So, you know, with the PRP, obviously, um, you know, it's the effect of the platelets that we're really trying to kind of optimize for uh, these patients. So, like I said, you kind of, you know, re-inject that concentration of platelets. That kind of changes the uh, microenvironment because of all the growth factors and cytokines that those release into that tissue. And uh, they can actually um, recruit local stem cells in that area to help them differentiate into uh, tissues to heal those structures as well, um, you know, versus, you know, stem cells, you know, so I guess PRP, you can kind of think of as like the spotlight that um, and you kind of put on that tissue to like signal your body to come in and heal that area. Stem cells kind of does a similar thing. And we often use PRP along with stem cells uh, to kind of combine the process. But, you know, with stem cells, you're getting a little bit more of that cell signaling that occurs likely getting, you know, a fair amount of differentiation into the uh, tissues required or that you're trying to heal uh, that will kind of help that process. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, you know, by releasing the growth factors as well and kind of having that paracrine effect, uh, that's how you generally kind of get that benefit with this. And this is kind of specific to, you know, orthopedic conditions. Um, you know, there are people and the world, like, you know, the Stem Cell Institute and uh, like in Panama and, you know, places like the Cayman Islands where they're actually doing intravenous stem cells. So you can actually run it through like an infusion, um, you know, of the patient's own stem cells that they actually ex culture expand in a lab uh, and then they can uh, inject them in the patient. There's some theoretical uh, kind of issues with that. And, you know, a lot of, you know, scientists you know, think that the stem cells might kind of get stuck in the pulmonary vasculature when they're kind of doing that, not causing a, you know, pulmonary embolism or anything, but, you know, getting kind of broken down there and not necessarily getting to all the different tissues where they're needed. Um, but that is something that's being done and also being studied this time. Um, another patient, or another uh, question was, I've had two spinal fusion surgeries, but still experience back pain, especially in the lumbar area. Would orthobiologics potentially be of benefit for me even post surgery? Uh, so it's uh, hard to say. You know, generally speaking, when you've had a spinal fusion, you know, obviously the segments that are fused uh, tend to become immobilized. Uh, so, for example, say that patient of the with the spine I was kind of showing you earlier with the L4 5 and L5 S1 disc injuries, they might fuse from L4 down to the sacrum. So a few levels that they put some hardware in. And once you've kind of done that, it's hard to treat, you know, the, the ligaments, the joints, uh, you know, the disc and things like that with regenerative medicine procedures, where it can still be beneficial, uh, I think for patients that have had fusions, um, is treating the adjacent segments. So often when you get a fusion, the SI joints below the fusion or, you know, the uh, levels above the fusion uh, start taking a lot more stress. So they're taking a lot more of that load, um, you know, that the, you know, the area that was previously fused uh, used to take. So those areas tend to degenerate at a little bit more of an accelerated pace. Uh, so their GERF medicine can kind of help slow that process, help keep those ligaments and tissues strong to help those joints uh, not wear out as quickly. So I think that's where you could potentially have the most benefit with the regenerative medicine procedures for something like that. Um, do you know treat patients with periacetabular osteotomies and their long-term success rates? Uh, so this isn't something <clears throat> that I've personally treated uh, uh, in my practice. I do believe, um, uh, so Regenix kind of headquarters is this practice called Centeno Schultz Clinic. Uh, it's a clinic out in Broomfield, Colorado. Uh, so I do believe that they actually have done uh, treatments on these patients and had some success, but I don't have any specific, specific examples for that or really know what the long-term success rates with it are. But, you know, theoretically, there is some, um, you know, uh, benefit that could be derived with, you know, particularly stem cell injections. So a lot of times when patients have 
Uh, so like say severe arthritis in their knee, for example, and they start getting kind of bone on bone issues, you get bone changes. So you get kind of, uh, you know, changes in the bone marrow and the actual bone structure around that joint because of the stress it's kind of taking. And it changes that, you know, bone from healthy bone into kind of unhealthy bone. So a lot of times what we'll do in these cases is actually drill a little hole into that bone and then inject a large volume of stem cells into that. And that's been shown to give much better outcomes for people with severe knee arthritis um, than if you don't do that. Um, so that's, that's, you know, theoretically something, you know, that could be helpful with the, uh, the hips too. Um, does the treatment help with herniated cervical disc as well? Uh, so yeah, so there are, um, you know, we don't do cervical intradiscal injections at our clinic, at least not at this time. We probably will start offering that eventually. The risk with the cervical discs um, is, you know, the cervical spine is a little bit more um, narrow. There's not as much room around the spinal nerves there as there are uh, in the lower back. Uh, so when you're doing an intradiscal injection, you do that in the, you know, the lumbar spine is a little bit less risk. Theoretically, in the cervical spine, if you inject a little bit of volume there, which is also a much smaller disc anyways, it could kind of push out a little bit more before it starts healing. Um, so there's some theoretical risk with that, but I will say I know a lot of, uh, you know, people I know and trust very well uh, in this field that are doing the intradiscal um, injections for the cervical spine and have gotten very good results with that. So there is definitely a, uh, you know, a use for that and a place for that. Um, and then what other procedures would you try if a patient has a poor outcome from another procedure? Uh, so again, this kind of depends, you know, um, I guess to uh, um, clarify, is this what other uh, regenerative medicine procedures would you try if a patient already had one or Oxytocin. Yeah, if you could clarify that one. That'll help a little bit. But um, so basically, um, you know, if you've already had a regenerative, regenerative medicine procedure, uh, so say you start with PRP, you could always bump it up to stem cells. Um, if someone's already been trying like chronic pain injections, uh, things like that, that can definitely be, uh, you know, something that's kind of bumped up to regenerative medicine. And often I'll kind of encourage regenerative medicine before, you know, traditional steroids and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, if it's a surgery, uh, you know, that they uh, have already had a poor outcome from, uh, that can be a little bit trickier. Um, so that would really kind of depend on the surgery, you know, what the other issues are. You know, for example, if someone gets a knee replacement uh, surgery, uh, you know, that needs kind of, done in terms of other options of things you can do. So you can't really even do a steroid injection on that knee anymore once they've had the knee replacement. So if they still have pain following that uh, knee replacement, which, you know, they do fail, you know, there are some patients that don't get good outcomes or get worse pain afterwards. Uh, then all of a sudden, <clears throat> you're very limited in what you can do. And these are, you know, the kinds of patients that generally will end up on opioids or other pain medications, um, you know, kind of for the rest of their lives. So, you know, it's, you know, again, that's where I think these regenerative medicines kind of fit in as a way to hopefully avoid a patient from ever getting to that point. Uh, so, you know, once you have surgery and once you have a poor outcome with surgery, it's a lot harder to go back and get a good result with the stem cells than if you try, or PRP, than if you try the PRP and stem cells before going to surgery. Um, you know, because you have your healthy native tissue, you know, um, before surgery, but once you have the surgery, you know, a lot of times you get scar tissue, um, you, know, you get kind of, you know, changes if they do anything with the bone, um, or with the disc or nerves, you know, and they're cutting things out. So it does make it a little bit more challenging, uh, to kind of treat in those settings. Um, and what do you think the future of stem cell applications and treatments, especially those which are not currently FDA approved? Um, you know, so I do think there's, you know, this is going to be a kind of ever expanding kind of field for now. You know, it's uh, a lot of potential for stem cells in a, a lot of different uh, clinical areas. So not just pain and orthopedics, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, 
think one of the really big areas that people are kind of looking at are neurodegenerative processes. So, you know, for example, people that have spinal cord injury, you know, had like a significant trauma, injured the, the actual spinal cord. Uh, I know Mayo Clinic's doing some studies on this now where they're actually injecting stem cells into the CSF, you know, around the spinal cord injuries. And there have been some uh, good results with that actually in the early, early data with that. Um, the, you know, things like Parkinson's disease, uh, I know is kind of a, a hot area. Um, and then uh, like things like ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, they're kind of looking at a lot. Um, you know, the nerve degenerative diseases are just really not any good cures for. And I think trying to find ways to apply this to the, you know, uh, the brain, the spinal cord and uh, nervous tissue to kind of help that tissue regenerate is something that's, uh, you know, a very intriguing area of this uh, kind of future path. Um, you know, and then hopefully kind of, uh, I mean, I don't know how long it's going to take to get this out of the lab, but, you know, eventually kind of helping to regrow tissue that, you know, is either injured or amputated or, um, you know, kind of beyond uh, repair with kind of our normal um, healing processes. So, you know, hopefully that will kind of, um, you know, become a little bit better elucidating what we'll be able to do with that. Um, how successful was or has regenerative medicine been in patients with arthritis? Uh, so this is actually an area where I think regenerative medicine has some of the most uh, data, actually. So uh, osteoarthritis in particular, uh, there's been tons of studies looking at uh, knees, hips, shoulders, uh, small joints in the hands, wrists, elbows, foot and ankle. And um, a lot of these patients, uh, you know, do tend to get at least somewhat better um, after these treatments. So uh, if you look at the Regenix website, they actually have like a live patient outcome data as well. So they've been around for about 15 years, tracking all the data and all the patients that have been treated within their network. Uh, and it, you know, kind of just tracks like pain scores, functional improvement um, and all that. And then they use that to help guide us and candidacy grading. So we can kind of look at a patient that's of a certain age that has a certain joint that's affected and uh, of a certain severity. So for example, you know, you have a 75 year old with, uh, you know, hip osteoarthritis that's severe on MRI, they're not going to be a great candidate for these procedures versus, um, you know, someone that's, you know, say 25, you know, has a uh, mildly injured meniscus in the knee or arthritic knee. And, um, uh, you know, the MRI is otherwise pretty normal they'll generally have a better outcome. So, you know, we kind of look at all of these factors, you know, even outside of the fact they have arthritis to determine what kind of candidate they'll be. And their overall health obviously has a big role in that too. So, you know, someone that has, again, like diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, you know, cardiac issues, kidney issues, they're just not going to have healthy blood products to re-inject into that tissue and are going to have a lower likelihood to heal. But and a pure isolated arthritis um, with proper management and kind of preparation, those patients can do very well. And I think that was the last question. Yeah, if you guys, again, if you guys ever have any questions that kind of come up, you know, regarding this or, you know, just, uh, you know, want to kind of get some more information about, you know, regenerative medicine and the studying, uh, again, feel free to reach out to me at any point, okay? And thank you all for taking the time to be here with me tonight. Thank you for the presentation, Dr. Kohler. Um, you answered pretty much every question in like a lot of depth. Um, Hopefully it wasn't too much depth. <laughs> no, they were very important. And the uh, um, case, case studies were interesting. Um, thank you everyone for coming out here. Our next session is going to be on, on June 9th with Dr. Uh, Stuckus. We hope to see you all there. I've attached the link to the virtual shadowing quiz and um, all of our platforms in the chat. All right. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good night. Take care, guys. Thank you.